All right, it is 6.35. Um, we will go ahead and get started. Um, we do record these meetings so that way if people can't make them, um, we can post them. We actually did post the ones from, what is that? March, April, May. April and May <laughs> already online. Um, so we're posting them on YouTube. So if you want to go back and look at those or if there are others who have asked for those, um, they are online now and we'll post this one online as well. Um, my name is Ebony Rose Thompson. I'm the chair of the War 7 Education Council. Um, so far, I think we have two board members on the line. I see uh, Nzinga Hall, who's the corresponding secretary, and I see Laura Fuchs, who's our recording secretary. Um, we haven't had much like ed council-y type business in the time of corona. Um, so that's been a little bit of a shorter section for us. Um, we will kind of share out. Um, we didn't, I don't think we had anything we voted on last meeting, or collect, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but um, we'll continue to share, up the, share out the meeting minutes and like the follow-up emails. It's kind of weird to do that on the Zoom calls, um, but we'll continue to send those out because we do take minutes for the meetings. Um, just a little bit of background on kind of why we're having this discussion today. Um, typically this time of year by June, it's, it's wind up time. We already know <laughs> kind of like what school budgets look like. We're kind of saying goodbye uh, and saying we'll see you in September. Um, this year, just due to the state of the world, everybody's just kind of on a whole different timeline. Um, and we are actually currently, um, it is currently that time of year where the budget is in front of the DC Council. Um, so we're having that discussion. Um, but also, or continuing to have that discussion, um, but also there are things that we definitely would not have anticipated um, even at the beginning of the year um, for schools. Um, so we've gotten a decent amount of questions and had some conversation with parents about like what does reopening look like? So that continues to um, change, grow and change. Um, so we'll continue to try to create spaces to update people. Um, we, I know we have um, Claudia who will be joining us from DCPS, um, and then we have Lenora. Lenora, do you have two last names? Yes, <laughs> Robinson Mills. Okay, I saw Mills, but I was like, that's incomplete. Um, so, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we had representatives from both um, the charter and the uh, DCPS sides and kind of some of what we are thinking about, but also to hear from some community members as far as what they're thinking about in regards to reopening. A lot of times um, we have families that straddle both communities. Um, so we wanted to create space for those things. And because this is not how we knew the world would look not too long ago, um, there are probably some things that will come up that are budget implication items for that. And so that's why we're talking reopening first uh, and then budget second. Um, a couple of housekeeping things, and then I will talk a lot less. Um, first housekeeping thing, um, the chat has worked really well as a way to um, capture questions. We did put out an email before this meeting asking people to submit questions to us. We actually did not get a lot back this go around. Um, but kind of as the conversation goes on, if you put items in the chat, we will monitor the chat and we will lift up those questions to make sure everything is answered. It's both a really good way um, to hold us accountable um, and to like see um, like during the meeting and after the meeting. So please put your questions in the chat. Um, it just makes facilitation a lot easier. Um, if there are items that we can't answer today, because I know that there are certain things that kind of are developing. Um, we're definitely going to flag those and follow up. Um, we do have when we, and then we'll transition. So, and then that's true for reopening um, and budget. Um, so, I, Laura and Nzinga, am I missing anything? Y'all see me with my cup of coffee at 639. So, that's absolutely possible. <laughs> All right, hearing none, I'm gonna say that's a no. So I will, I guess we'll start with Lenore. Lenore, did you wanna introduce yourself um, so people know what your role is at the Public Charter School Board? 
Yep. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Lenora Robinson Mills. I'm the COO at the DC Public Charter School Board. I've been um, at the Public Charter School Board for about five years. And um, I'm happy to join the Ward 7 Education Council meeting this evening and share um, any updates or answer any questions um, related to school reopening. I don't see that Claudia has joined us yet. Who sees Kujata though? Yeah, hi Ebony um, and everyone. Claudia is definitely joining. My guess is she is like getting her kids dinner together and about to join. So I promise she's planning on joining. And I'm I'm also on the team at DCPS for folks I haven't met and mainly listening and um, planning to take good notes um, on all your feedback and questions. Okay. Awesome. Um, so and I'm I know gonna... Saba's trying to get in right now as well. I think she might be having some Zoom difficulties, but she's on the way as well. Okay. I don't see Saba yet in the waiting room, but as soon as I see her, we will admit her. Okay. Um, so maybe it's a maybe it's a good place to start um, as far as just like how like where you all are in your thinking like I don't I think a lot of people don't know like who makes those decisions um and like when or where they might be reported out so just kind of an overview of how you all are thinking their thoughts um of kind of how you all are thinking about it might be super helpful yep um so Public charter schools have been working with their staff and across the city to prepare for next school year. I'm sure all of you know there are a lot of moving pieces and a lot of things that schools will need to consider that they didn't have to consider in any other school opening before. Um, PCSB is planning to release its school recovery policy in the next couple weeks, and that new policy is going to require that schools share back with us detailed information about their plans for reopening um, in the next school year. So their plans for distance learning, their plans for communicating to families, their plans for assessing student um, learning throughout the school year, um, and their overall plans for operations in the school, just to name a few things that'll be included in those plans. And most importantly, um, the plans will include how they're going to implement um, the health guidance that DC Health and ASI have issued um, in the last few days. So um, when I finish speaking, I can drop links in the um, chat to the guidance that DC Health issued last week and the guidance that came out today from ASI around the requirements or the, the policy guidance is what they're calling it, um, based on the reopen DC Education Committee's guidance that they submitted to the mayor a couple weeks ago. And so um, one of the key pieces of that, in addition to um, the critical um, hygiene requirements around wearing masks and washing hands and social distancing, is that um, no more than 10 individuals at a time can be in a classroom. And so that will require um, a lot of changes to school schedules. I'm sure many of you have heard um, that uh, DC schools, public schools and charter schools are considering and trying to um, evaluate different rotational schedule options to make sure that they're adhering to the guidance of no more than 10 individuals um, in a classroom. Um, many public charter schools are coordinating with the city on opening up, um, starting with a transitional phase in August. Um, for small groups of students, either students who are new to the school or in transitional years, be that third grade, sixth grade, ninth grade. Um, and I know that DCPS is starting August 31st is their first day of school and we're, we've been coordinating. So there are some charters that are aligning on that and some charters that already have plans set for different dates. And so it'll, um, each charter school's, you know, start date is up to, you know, each individual uh, LEA. Um, the schools have also been working with the DME to solicit input, the Deputy Mayor for Education, um, to solicit input for families on rotational schedules. So there was a big survey that went out. We can also add that to the chat um, 
for all that went out to all families across the city. Um, it's available on uh, coronavirus.zc.gov as well. Um, asking questions about rotational schedules and you know I actually just finished mine I have an incoming pre-k three student um, and it's asking you do you prefer one uh, two to three days per week or one full week or two full weeks and then off for two weeks or every other day rotations and so the city's trying to get that information from all as many families as possible um, to in an attempt to coordinate um, and help families with students in different schools get back to work with fewer child care issues. Um, so, so that's sort of the scheduling and the reopening standpoint and just um, things that we're hearing at the Public Charter School Board that schools are grappling with um, additional costs related to cleaning and um, purchasing PPE, facility upgrades and changes, technology expenses, and we've um, been having regular calls with the Deputy Mayor for Education throughout the entire coronavirus um, state of emergency, I'll say. Um, at first, I think it was daily, then it shifted to three times a week, and now we're down to two times a week. And on those calls, uh, schools are able to share their concerns with the DME and get information from the DME and from other government agencies and other partners um, related to general operations related to health related to some of their instruction virtual learning um, and one thing that has come up over the last couple of weeks is whether or not um, schools have been asking if the city is going to provide ppe for all schools and that is um, still a question mark and conversations are continuing um, so that is definitely something we're trying to figure out um, Enrollment, I think, is another concern that schools are um, really worried about. The deadline was extended to June 15th. Um, in previous years, it was May 1st. And this was a, you know, to allow schools the opportunity to implement um, an online enrollment process and give families more time because they were dealing with a lot and still are dealing with a lot. Um, and so I think as a result of that, there is not um, enrollment is, is very low. And so um, the deadline to enroll for families is June 15th for families that have been matched in the common lottery. Um, and so we encourage all families to enroll as soon as possible. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that the plans for reopening um, school are all contingent upon um, the city shifting to phase two. And right now we're in phase one. Phase one requires uh, everyone to remain 100% virtual. Uh, but phase two is the phase in which 10 individuals can be in a classroom. So that's what I think everyone is, is planning for by the fall or by August. Thank you. I want to make sure I recognize Claudia because she's joined us now. Um, Hi, Claudia. Hey, Claudia. Hi. <laughs> Um, Claudia, I don't know if you had anything to add. Yeah, so um, I caught, I think, um, a good chunk of Lenora, what Lenora said, but I'm happy to just share where DCPS is at in some of the thinking and then um, obviously touch on sort of the same broad um, buckets and areas that Lenora did. Um, so obviously we have been working on coming up with um, a few different scenarios and options that we're considering. Um, as you guys know, and I think Sujatha added the um, survey here, the DME released a citywide survey um, to all families um, asking several different questions, but included some different options of considering for different scheduling options for a hybrid, what we're sort of technically calling a hybrid schedule. Hybrid schedule means it's a combination of in-person days in the building um, coupled with um, and complemented by distance learning or learning from home. Um, and so, uh, essentially, I think they released three, four different options, um, but essentially it's just a combination of looking at a couple different factors. One is um, how many days a week uh, in-person attendance happens, um, and then do you do those days consecutive, do you do them spread out? There's a lot of iterations in which you can do that. Um, so I think it's either um, one or two days per week, um, is it Monday and Tuesday for one group and Wednesday and Thursday for another, or do you do Monday and Wednesday for one group and Tuesday and Thursday? So there's a lot of different iterations of how that looks, but I think the main purpose or concept is you go fewer days a week, but every week. 
right? And so thinking about what that consistency looks like and regularity. Um, and then there's a couple options that look at um, essentially um, combining all of um, the days for that one group into consecutive days. So you could essentially have students attending every, a group of students attending every day per week, um, but then off for a week or two. Um, and there are different iterations of how to do that. So essentially we would be combining the total number of school days in a month and making it consecutive um, and then off for a couple months, uh, a couple weeks. So there are different, the options essentially explore different ways to do that. And you're essentially playing with when do you have the in-person days um, and how many days are off for primarily used for distance learning. Um, and that is where, um, DCPS um, will be interested in seeing where families are as it relates to that survey. And so the idea is to be able to capture um, also the, where families is are and the different options, but then also we know that there are families um, and staff members that have expressed an interest or wanting to understand um, whether or not there will be a virtual only option. Um, for families that are not interested in engaging in any in-person schedule, will DCPS offer a virtual only program? And so we are currently looking at offering a virtual only option for families. Um, and so the survey also tries to capture the interest level of that and at what grade level. Um, and so um, we have simultaneously also released a, a student survey to our, um, for DCPS students. Um, so this is one that DCPS released separately. Um, it's not part of the DME survey, but in our communications, we had both of those links um, and this really also wants to get students input on what, um, what they see as sort of some of the um, elements to the different um, schedule options, where their head are at, what their interest and um, preference level is, as well as a couple questions around um, the content and supports that they might need. Um, so there are two surveys out and I think that everybody um, is, I think um, Sujatha linked to that. Um, we are working on a teacher survey for DCPS um, and so that is something um, that we're looking at both teacher survey as well as that would be open to um, all school-based staff. Um, and so we're working on getting that one out as well. Um, it will also ask similar questions, obviously from a teacher or staff perspective, what their um, considerations are from the different um, schedule options, but then also where their preferences are or where their head is at around um, level of comfort with um, engaging in in-person. Um, schedule. Um, and so we hope to get that out soon as well, um, the staff survey. Um, that will obviously help um, give us a sense of demand and interest on the different um, elements that we're considering. Um, we want to be cognizant, particularly with the family survey, that um, these type of electronic surveys we know can not capture all of the families that we need to capture. Um, and so understanding that um, it will not necessarily always be representative of all of our families. So really trying to figure out how the best way to um, capture that information is. Um, and so a couple other elements besides the scheduling, um, which is what uh, the survey focuses on, what um, Lenora talked a little bit through, and so what I also touched on, there's other elements of the thinking um, that we have um, started to do thinking around that we also need to know are critical elements of a reopening plan. Um, one is what does uh, learning from home and distance learning look like? Um, obviously from a family perspective, um, we did, uh, DCPS did do a family survey not that long ago to get feedback on how the virtual learning from home experience has been um, over the last few months um, since COVID, since the COVID closure. Um, wanting to sort of learn from what families were sharing, understanding um, there were challenges with the technology and access to the platforms. And so really thinking through what we can do better as we enter into um, school year 2021. Um, I think that's another element of the work that we're doing is to really try and hone in on what um, the distance learning will look like for families, but then also what it will look like for um, teachers and staff. Um, the other element um, of this that uh, we also want to be cognizant of is um, ensuring that as we're exploring different options, really understanding how this impacts um, services to um, our special education students or English learners, um, and really understanding that um, we want to ensure that we are still 
um, maintaining a level of commitment to the services that we need to provide, but understanding what that would look like. Are there opportunities to prioritize extra time um, for certain groups this is also something that we're exploring and something that we're looking at as we evaluate the different options that are on the table. Um, and so understanding what that prioritization would look like, where there are opportunities for us to think differently about serving um, uh, some of these students for this from opportunity. So that's another element of the work. And then of course our ops team has been doing a lot of work on, uh, we know that wherever we land on an in-person schedule, um, it is going to be different. Our schools are going to be different. They are going to operate differently. Um, what does arrival look like, dismissal, lunch, recess, transitions among between classes, that will all feel and look different. And so um, our operations team is doing um, a lot of work to think through what are the right protocols, um, what are the right safety regulations and requirements that we will need to meet um, and ensure that we are providing the necessary support and guidance to staff around how staff can support um, students in that process, but then also how we can support staff who are also engaging in these processes at the school level. Um, so I think that is um, an element that we are uh, also sort of thinking through in terms of understanding what those implications are. Um, I think there are, and again, part of this is really understanding outside of, um, and so Norris Port sort of like, what does this look like from an enrollment perspective? Um, you know, this has been, this whole thing has been hit right during sort of the enrollment as enrollment was about to open and start. And so we are all kind of bracing ourselves for what does that mean? How will enrollment patterns trends change? Um, as folks might know, we, um, DCPS was um, able to launch a electronic submission process for enrollment um, through the seamless stocks um, program. And so now families have an, a way to um, submit enrollment paperwork via a mobile device. Um, and yeah, electronically. And so um, that is also, we understand that that is very new for families and parents and really trying to understand um, how to get folks up to speed on how to feel comfortable with using um, those platforms as well as our school staff in managing that with, with families. Um, and so it's gonna be interesting in terms of how this plays out from an enrollment perspective um, and what we can do. Um, there's sort of a lot of elements of that. I don't know if there's any particular pieces I can speak to. All right, let me, I haven't been following the chat. So yeah, I, Claudia, just to lift up, with that. Laura. Oh, go ahead. No, I want to lift up one question from the, the first question that came in from the chat. And you started to talk about some pieces of this. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it both goes to Claudia and Lenora. Um, Alicia asks, what kinds of conversations are happening regarding equity for students with low incomes and homeless students? Um, what kind of supports are being discussed? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So there's a lot of different ways in which we have to approach that question, um, both thinking about the equity lens and the impact of one, where we land on an actual um, scheduling decision is one area. Also understanding, um, and again, that is unpacking that is big in terms of one, um, when we even think about the hybrid model, as I mentioned earlier, um, what does the distance um, learning or learning from home process look like and how, um, where have been the back gaps in our ability to support our families engaging in the distance learning that happened this past spring. Um, and so wanting to make sure that we're thinking and being thoughtful about uh, responding to that and providing additional supports as needed moving into reopening. I do think from, um, as we think about the um, operational and other elements of what that looks like, understanding access to equipment, access to um, healthcare and security is something that is also top of mind. Um, we, we know that, that there is a disproportionate impact of COVID-19 um, on um, many of our communities. And so understanding what that means as we evaluate um, different um, uh, different options and as we think about um, what the health implications are, um, exposure implications both for our students and families um, in, in understanding what that would look like and how that impacts um, um, several of our communities. So I think that is an interesting, that's also a big element of that. And then also understanding that we have to be cognizant of not just thinking about what are the in-person teaching and learning services that we're thinking through in a scheduling model, but what does that mean 
for um, the touch points that students and families have with our support services provided at schools, whether it's our health, mental or, or health care providers in our schools. Um, you know, one of the, as you guys know, one of the options is having sort of um, students come in for one week and then off for two weeks. And I think that is one of the options that's in the survey. Um, the feedback that we have been getting um, from staff and some parents and stakeholders has been um, that there is a gap in those two week gaps. Um, just decreases our opportunity to have touch points with our students and families. And what does that do? And what are the implications of that for our most vulnerable students and families? Um, and so as we think about and evaluate those different options, thinking through what that looks like is going to be important. Um, and then also just ensuring that the support staff have the equipment and the access they need to continue to provide the supports for students. As you guys know, there are, there have been a handful of students that we had um, no connection with these past spring. Um, how do we ensure that that, um, uh, that we close that gap and that we are thoughtful about ensuring that we have opportunities for that. As I mentioned earlier, in each of um, in each of the scenarios, there are sort of flex times or flex spaces um, within the, the week and within the schedule. Um, how do we think strategically about leveraging those flex times to be able to um, prioritize certain families and certain students within that for either more support services or more in-person touch points? Lenora, I, I don't know if you wanted to add anything or, or Saba or Nicole. I'll just add, uh, hey, so you. yeah, this is Nia. Uh, Dad came home with the kids from grandma's house an hour before he was supposed to. <laughs> kids are coming in the door right now. Um, not on schedule, right, Lenora? That's not. <laughs> there, there is no schedule. There is no schedule. <laughs> um, so the only other thing I'll, I'll add, um, I saw, I think Alicia, um, added in as far as meals, technology, and wraparound services. So I just want to note that in schools planning, they are definitely taking into consideration how to ensure that uh, students have access to meals, whether or not they are on campus or off campus. Um, and the same with technology. I think our schools did a pretty good job this year um, of making sure that um, they were getting technology. It took, you know, a couple weeks or a few weeks for some schools who weren't already one-to-one, -one, um, but they did a pretty good job of getting technology, getting devices to all of their um, students. Um, I think the ongoing concern in regards to technology, specifically for low-income families, are um, is, is access to broadband, and that's something that has been a conversation. Wait a minute. Um, has been a conversation uh, in, I think, in many realms with the Deputy Mayor of Education. I think it's come up with City Council um, in terms of how do we make sure that uh, low-income families and all families have access to broadband. Um, Laura, were you about to add something, Claudia? I was just gonna say, I think that's right. On the technology piece, that's definitely a big concern and something that DCPS is thinking through in terms of ensuring that um, if we go to this hybrid model that we, um, we understand where those technology gap gaps are and can provide that support. Um, it's also something that we've been hearing from families is um, also challenges in accessing, accessing technology, even if they might have a device, is accessing the platform for some of our youngest children. Um, and really that does require a lot more um, parental involvement in sort of getting that. And so that has been shared with a lot of families in terms of thinking through needing to have much more supports for parents who need to engage in that. Um, and definitely echo on the meals, we will continue to have meals available um, as I understand it, um, even in a hybrid model available for um, all students. Laura asked how are teachers and staff collaborating in the reopening decision-making process? Are teachers being included in those conversations? Um, that's a great question. We've had um, one current conversation with our teacher cabinet, um, who where we also shared um, our latest thinking um, around the different options that we're considering, got a lot of feedback. Um, we've held different um, 
focus groups with principals um, and uh, sort of our next step on the teacher piece is obviously the survey is a big one to reach a broader, I mean, our, survey, our teacher um, pool is, is very large. And so one cabinet we know is not uh, representative of, of, you know, close to any of all the teachers. So the teacher survey is sort of the next step in that process. Um, and then thinking through what is the ongoing engagement with teachers and staff um, is also sort of on our radar to get, get through. Principals um, have been engaged, um, whether it's the Leadership Academy, then follow up different focus groups with different teams. My team, the operations team as well, um, have been engaging um, that. And then we know that there are definitely, um, and it's my understanding sort of the ops team will be engaging different staff members from an operational perspective um, throughout the summer in terms of getting their, um, their perspective on some of the, the operational changes that we anticipate happening. Does um, PCSB have a way to engage teachers or is that being kind of left up to the individual LEAs? That's being left up to the individual LEAs. Um, the only thing I'll add is that we've heard a lot um, from school leaders who are taking into consideration that their staff um, are also parents and so are navigating, um, managing, you know, homeschooling themselves and managing, um, child care and also uh, that a lot of their staff live in Maryland or Virginia um, even though the schools are located in DC um, and so they're taking into consideration plans for reopenings um, in in those jurisdictions as well Uh, I see a question from Rhonda. What supports are in place for students with disabilities? If a student has a service that cannot be met in the classroom setting, um, PT, how will their needs be met, or physical, I'm assuming that's physical, um, how will their needs be met with the rotational model? You're on mute, Claudia. I know, sorry. Um, that's a great question. Um, uh, that is something that our DSI team has been doing a lot of thinking around what this would look like in a reopening scenario. Um, they, this is also one of the reasons that we will have to maximize some of the off sort of flexible off days um, to be able to ensure that we can um, provide further services to our special education students as well as um, English learner students. So that, um, that's definitely on our radar. I, I don't think we've sort of landed the plane nearly around what that will look like, but it is definitely top of mind for our DSI team. Um, and also understanding that we, we will likely want to and need to leverage um, the available times potentially that are outside of, of, of maybe a set schedule um, for, for some of the service provision. So that's something we're thinking through now. The, I was, uh, there's a question about, um, so two questions, uh, how will teachers do for in-person distance learning instruction? That's a great question. When we are talking about our um, in-person schedule, when we say students are in the building, for example, two days a week, that actually means that those teachers are teaching four days a week um, because we have to, we have to you know, uh, couple divide the students. So it's very, we're very cognizant of that. It's um, their, and understanding what that means for what distance learning looks like um, and the availability of teachers to support students in that process. Um, our teaching and learning team is sort of thinking through what would that look like? What would the hybrid, the distance learning um, element of the hybrid plan um, look like when we know that our teacher force, even in a two day schedule, uh, a two day, student schedule is really a four-day schedule for those teachers um, in that case. So it's a great question. I think that that's um, our folks in teaching learning are very cognizant and thinking through what is feasible and not feasible in that scenario. Uh, I think Carla actually has a question about scheduling. Are schools considering parent ability to manage these manage. schedules given work responsibilities? Um, and then Laura, I also see your question about health and maintenance staff, but since we're on scheduling, um, yeah. Um, hey, Carla. Um, that is a good question. This is also something that has come up a lot because we, to Lenora's earlier point, we do have, so there's a couple of big pieces that we know will impact our plans that are 
not necessarily within DCPS control, but that are important factors for students and families. One is um, where we are as a city with um, work schedules. Um, will families be expected to be in the office? Like what, how much is, will we be open at the time? Um, and what will that look like for parents who either need to go into work, who are working from home? Um, and what will that look like? We also know that transportation is also a big piece. So we know that um, families uh, will rely on public transportation to get to and from school. And so the availability of that, also the concerns that families might have with using public transportation during safety concern times um, is also top of mind because we know that that will also play into this. Um, and then another thing that has been raised is the coordination, to Lenora's earlier point, the coordination across um, uh, across neighboring counties. Um, we know that a lot of our workforce um, also uh, may not live in the district. Um, and so what does that mean for um, coordinating um, with those districts? So um, those are all the right questions. Um, I think we are trying to figure out what that means, knowing where we'll land with that, but what that means and how that would impact um, a, a schedule. Um, I do think that one of the things that has come up, um, and I believe that the city and the deputy mayor's office is exploring, is really looking at um, a potential uh, sort of, uh, call it kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, either childcare hubs or sort of learning hubs for students. Yeah, learning hubs, yeah. Learning hubs. So, so students who, uh, um, yeah. yeah, through other city agencies, students who um, are not in their in-person schedule but cannot be home because they do not have supervision at home, are there places in which those students can go to engage in any in distance learning or engage in work where there's supervision available? Um, and so I know the city is looking at um, and thinking through what that service could look like and how could that be available for families that um, don't have access to childcare and that need to go to work. So can I try to restate and this is maybe for my own understanding you said for the learning hubs are for students who maybe it's not an in-person day for them but maybe they're a young child and they do not have supervision is that correct that's right so they're not supposed to be at school they're supposed to be at home but their parent has to work um and they may not have access to child care right so okay. um, they may have access to child care and so this would be would this be a space that would be available um to these families it wouldn't be a teacher it wouldn't be like a classroom it would be a supervision space for sort of like child you know learning hub space and who who would run like are those i'm a, they, those sound like they're not dcps specific no they're looking at that for all um all students across the city and they're looking at uh parks and recreation uh, sites, so rec centers, and um, public libraries. Are there other points of coordination um, between like DCPS and public charter schools? I know that like, for example, Claudia, you mentioned um, coordinating across jurisdictions to make sure like families or teachers can manage their schedules. Um, what could or does that look like across DCPS and other LEAs? Um, I, yeah, I'll let Laura, Lenora speak to that because I know that that's something that DME has been in the space of creating that opportunity for collaboration. Um, and so I have not been sort of in those conversations, but Lenora might have more. I think um, one major piece of, or one major source of collaboration as we think about planning for the upcoming school year is uh, the survey, the family survey that I mentioned earlier. Um, and that was really a big effort and a big push to attempt to coordinate across the city um, in terms of scheduling. And um, of course, every uh, charter school, every charter LEA is not going to um, follow the DCPS schedule, but I think the goal is for there to be consensus as much as possible um, around some of that coordination to support families. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the chat. Um, Laura asked about staffing, um, schools being able to get more health and building maintenance staff. I'm guessing this is in response to like some of the guidance, the health guidance from the reopening committee. Um, so I don't, I'm not currently aware, and but again, not because it's not being thought of. Um, 
around whether or not there would be adding um, staff to buildings. Um, I do know that um, uh, the operations teams is thinking through what it means to have to operationalize some of the health requirements. And so what does that mean or look like? Um, I don't know how that translates in terms of additional staff or um, how that impacts. I think part of this is how that impacts the role of staff at the school site. And I think they're thinking through that now, but I don't have an answer to that specific question currently. What options are, will be available for teachers and staff? And that's what I was about to ask. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's a great question. Part of the goal, so there's a couple things here. Part of the goal of the um, staff survey is to try and get a pulse check of level of comfort um, with staff members who um, are thinking about whether or not um, they, an opportunity for staff members to express whether or not they are comfortable returning or coming to or in, uh, engaging in an in-person schedule. Um, because we don't necessarily have a good count on what that would look like, um, I think that is one of the goals of trying to get this staff survey out there is to try and get a sense of what does that um, what is the potential level of just, or how many um, staff members are in that space? Lenore, do you know of anything LEAs are doing on the PHCSB side? Um, I, I think that is up to each individual LEA. And so it's something that has come up on some of these calls with the DME in terms of, you know, trying to understand how you provide support to teachers who might be um, at higher risk uh, with for COVID, and um, also how do you staff in the event that you know teachers aren't able uh, to be on site in person? So I know it's something they're grappling with. I think they will probably have to come up with um, creative solutions depending on what their staffing looks like. You know, each charter school staffing looks a little different. Um, so it could be that those teachers who are not coming in the building potentially might be providing instruction to the students who are also not coming into the building. So they might be doing 100% virtual instruction, for example. Okay, I see a question. Um, has there been a comprehensive plan around testing students before they come back to school? Are providing schools with testing kit, are, are we providing schools with testing kits for students? To my um, knowledge, we are not providing testing kits. I think the city has done a really good job of making tests available um, across the board. And so that's something that I, I, I don't think is currently in the plan, but I'm not sure, Claudia, you've heard any other conversations about that. Um, yeah, I'm not aware of that yet. I do know that, and, and part of the, the challenge here is that we know that health guidance and availability of tests and all and sort of the updating of protocols is an evolving process. Um, and so what we know is available right now may be very different in two months. Um, and so I think for us is trying to make sure that we are in a position where um, uh, we are in a position where we can um, be responsive to what the latest availability of information um, as well as um, access to different um, tools and resources from a health perspective so that we can be responsive to that. I don't currently, I'm not currently aware of a plan for that right, right at this moment. Is there guidance um, that has been recommended to provide to children or families? I mean, well, provide it to families around self-quarantining or? So, yeah. Yeah. So, what that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. So, this is a good question. There's a couple different protocols that we're going to have to put in place. Um, obviously, the initial um, parameters are going to be directed by the health department. Um, and so, what that looks like for, um, and so obviously, they will then set guidelines for what does, um, and I'm blanking on this word, like, the tracing, tracing mechanisms. Contact tracing, yeah. Yeah, so tracing, quarantining, like they have very strict guidelines. Now we will have to take those, adapt them to what that means for schools, understand and have a closure, a, a, a protocol for whether we have isolated closures or incidents 
whether we need a protocol for more extended closures, depending on um, the exposure. Um, and so all those protocols are definitely on our list to, to, for the teams to be, to set up and put in place so that we are aware as well as um, schools are aware. Um, currently, as you guys know, some of those protocols had to be set and put in place um, earlier this past spring. Um, so there, there was a lot of work happening uh, months ago around setting up what the um, reporting tool would look like. Um, and so, sorry, <laughs> TV here. Um, and so what, some of that had to happen this past spring. As you guys know, we did, um, I think had one or two instances where we had to close particular schools down. Then that also triggers a cleaning requirement and a cleaning protocol. Um, and so we will have to go back, update those protocols based on more um, uh, updated relevant health guidance and then provide those protocols and be prepared for what that means if we have a rule in closure, um, if we have a school closing, what does that mean to learning? Does it all go to um, distance? Um, how long would, could it be if there a school closed? We'll have to think through and, and have all those protocols for those scenarios. Well, you mentioned cleaning protocols, which is perfect. Uh, looks like Principal Williams would like to know how will schools be funded to ensure that there are enough sanitizing and cleaning supplies for the next year? Yeah, so I don't know, um, I can't tell you the mechanics. I know that we will be responsible and have to ensure that schools have the available hand sanitizer and cleaning mechanisms, whether that is purchased centrally um, or whether that is pushed down to school budgets. That I don't have the details for, um, but I know that, that we're gonna have to have that available. But in the past, when we've had to do big things, sometimes that will be purchased centrally, sometimes not. It sort of depends on where, what that process looks like. Yep. Um, I think that's definitely something that schools are um, budgeting for right now. I don't know that there is, if I'm on the charter side, that there will be additional funding um, outside of the UPSFF increase for um, sanitizing or cleaning supplies. I would just also add that part of part of the um, the interpretation of the guidelines is coming from Aussie. So Aussie is looking at the DOH inter guidelines and interpreting that for what that means for schools. And some of, of the planning that is happening for reopening is was based on the reopen DC report and getting those updated guidelines. So some of this will emerge over the next couple of months as schools go into full out planning. So I think that the conversation that we'll, need, that we'll be having um, over the summer is about how schools will implement some of these guidelines and make sure that all of the proper social distancing measures are in place. I see another question in the chat. How are evaluations of student learning being reworked to ensure students are acquiring the necessary knowledge to advance to the next grade level. Um, not necessarily standardized testing, um, but being able to assess their student learning. That is a great question. One that I, am, I know that I'm not gonna be able to answer. It's definitely outside of my lane. I'm happy to go back to my colleagues at OTL um, and get um, get a response to that. I think that is a great question. I know I've heard them sort of talk about it in other platforms when we've got similar questions. So um, I'm, I'm happy to follow up with Ebony Rose and make sure she gets the information. But sorry, I, I'm, I feel like I'm not gonna be able to answer that well. Um, from the, on the charter side, that's something that we will have a better sense of when we get all the plans back from each um, charter, uh, telling us what, how they're going to um, approach distance learning and assess learning loss and student learning during distance learning next school year. Um, since no one asked and we're coming up on 7.30 pretty quickly, um, what about summer learning? Um, any plans around summer learning um, that we can share now? Um, yeah, so I know that we have plans for sort of uh, as DCPS has been talking about it, we have kind of two different um, summer plans. We have summer school, and then we have sort of summer bridge work. Um, and that is 
um, there's a couple different thoughts. The summer bridge is the opportunity. Again, our currently as it as it's now, our first day of school is we're planning to will continue to be August 31st. The idea of a summer bridge program in early August um, is an opportunity to be able to bring in, um, I think it's third rising third, sixth and ninth graders coming in to do some targeted learnings and summer bridge programming to get them ready for the start of the school year in hopes to try and also understanding that there has been, I mean, we already operate with a summer learning loss in general, knowing that that is compounded with COVID-19, um, trying to get a, that up and running. Um, the goal is that we potentially, I mean, one of the things that we're thinking through is will that, will we be in the transition phase two at that point um, in early August? And can we use that as an opportunity to start to test out in-person schedules? Um, for the summer bridge. And so that's something that we're kind of thinking through. Um, and then that is um, new. We definitely have some schools that would do summer bridge programs on their own, but this is something that sort of is more of a district approach um, that comes on top of um, summer school, um, which we still have plans for, for June and July. Yep, on the on the charter side, I think each each LEA is, is doing things a little bit differently. So I think that's very campus specific. All right, uh, I think this will probably be the last question, uh, unless there's a mad rush to the chat, but I feel like there might not be. When will the staff surveys be sent out? I feel like this, Sasha asked, Sasha says, I feel like that as though, I feel as though their input is integral to this process. Yeah, so um, very soon it is, we're drafted, is going through a review process now. Um, we, it, you know, the scope sort of shifted. It started as teachers. We expanded it uh, for a larger staff. So we're wanting to make sure that we take this opportunity to um, to be mindful of the, the different roles and um, make sure that we're having the right questions in there. Um, but hopefully this will be pushed out any day now where we're, we're wanting to do this as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, and so I think there was an earlier question too. And obviously we have this stress with now, we have to think through, um, you know, making sure it's right. And then again, trying to push that as soon as possible. All right, uh, I'm gonna have us switch gears a little bit. So thank you, that was super helpful. I'm sure there was a, a lot of new information for people. Um, I wanna call on Kubila uh, to give us a, a little bit of an overview um, to frame our budget conversation um, so we can so, to kind of transition us a little bit. 727 is pretty good timing. Okay, That's great. Okay. Uh, thank you, because um, I'm going to hop off and go deal. With oh, I, I didn't know you were leaving us alone, Nora, but I totally understand. Yeah. <laughs> um, and before we else? transition, can can I do a, um, a big push for folks to help get that survey out, the family survey, for you guys to help get the family survey out through your networks, um, as well as the student survey link. I think both those links were shared in the chat. As soon as we have the teacher and staff one, we'll make sure to share it back um, with Ebony so she can get it out to the group. Um, obviously, we'll also share that with our schools. Um, but if any help you can do to get that out would be much appreciated. Awesome. We'd be happy to share. Okay. Uh, Kobila? Alrighty. Um, so, good evening, everyone. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Kobila Huddleston, and I am an education policy analyst with the DC Fiscal Policy Institute. Um, the DC Fiscal Policy Institute, one of our main missions is to um, promote widespread prosperity in the district. And we, we do that through policy research, budget analysis, as well as direct advocacy. Um, I believe this is my second time um, that I've been able to join the Ward 7 Ed Council. And I'm super grateful for this opportunity. Um, Ebony Rose and Laura and, and Zinga and Sujata, like I know you all, and I'm just really great. Um, well, I'm really excited to be here um, with other people that I don't necessarily um, know so well. Um, so I think 
a, a good sort of description of the presentation that I want to give is just to sort of situate um, our education budget in the current economic climate. Um, as you all are aware, uh, this pandemic has resulted in an economic shutdown. Um, and that has had consequences on how much revenue uh, DC is bringing in, as well as how much money the mayor um, is proposing in her fiscal year 21 budget. So um, first, I just wanna talk about the big picture for our revenue. So the CFO um, in April, he released some revised revenue projections that showed our city will leave, uh, excuse me, will lose uh, $1.5 billion in revenue through fiscal year 2021. Um, and that is not a small amount. Uh, DC has some reserves, some rainy day reserves that the city can use um, during economic downturns. And that revenue loss is larger than what our reserves were when we first started out. Our reserves were at about 1.43 uh, billion. Um, they're less than that now because we've since tapped into them, but the city um, as a result of the economic uh, downturn is, is facing significant revenue loss, both in the current fiscal year as well um, in fiscal year 21. And so based on those revised uh, revenue projections, the district uh, is facing a nearly 600 million uh, shortfall in fiscal year 2021. So knowing that the mayor had to find a way to balance the budget, and I'm sure you all have heard in like neighboring jurisdictions and across the state that many um, policymakers are slashing their budgets, especially their education budgets. Um, and so, I mean, I think it's a good thing that the mayor did not go full on cut I know that there are still problems in the budget, but um, in terms of our public education budget, um, while it doesn't necessarily advance like racial equity and address some of the more structural issues, um, it at least doesn't, I'd argue, set us like much, uh, it doesn't set us further back. I'd, and I'm sure that's debatable to some people on here, but that's my perspective. <laughs> um, so in terms of the proposed budget, how did the mayor reach um, her proposed budget? What she did was she used all of our fiscal year 2019 surplus. She dipped into some of our reserves. Um, she's also proposing a COLA freeze for all government employees, um, as well as she used some uh, creative savings, savings methods to balance the fiscal year 21 budget. Um, as I said, uh, you know, those were good steps for her to take because it didn't require her to slash all of our important services like um, services for homeless residents, um, our education budget, like I said, but it is a ve it's very much a status quo budget. Um, and given our current climate, it's not, it's insufficient, right? And so DCFPI, along with some other partners, um, mainly the Fair Budget Coalition, we've been talking about how policymakers need to raise revenue um, the conversation that we just had, you know, you all were raising really important questions like given these health guidelines and these uh, pandemic induced safety requirements, how are schools going to afford, uh, you know, bringing students back into the classroom or how are teachers going to effectively engage in distance learning if there's not enough money in the budget to support those efforts. Um, and so um, now I want to just transition and sort of talk about the overall education budget. So um, talking about what's happening with our, our littlest learners, our early childhood system, um, as well as our um, UPSFF and some other uh, buckets of the education budget. So um, before I do jump into that, though, I do want to note um, on the revenue side that DC is expected to receive about $48 million in federal relief uh, through the CARES Act. Um, it's not clear to DC, DCFPI yet um, how much of that money has already been received um, by the district. We do know that that money is not yet reflected in the budget books. So um, there is still money on the table. It's just we don't have a clear picture yet of what the district is planning on doing with those federal dollars. Um, and as soon as I learn, um, I will be happy to share that with Ebony Rose um, or Nzinga so they can pass that information on. Um, so in the early childhood space, uh, the budget really failed to ensure that our childcare industry is stabilized. 
Um, many providers have had to close their doors due to the pandemic. And the mayor's budget, while it doesn't make any cuts, um, pretty much just holds funding flat. And that is a problem in the same way that it's a problem to not um, adequately fund our public schools and that costs are gonna go up for providers. They're going to have to reduce classroom sizes, increase sanitation efforts. Um, and it's simply um, unacceptable to not provide some emergency relief funds. So the mayor's uh, budget doesn't do that. Um, there are also some cuts in home visiting programs, which we know are really integral um, to helping reduce child abuse and neglect, um, especially now when we think about uh, the pandemic and the isolation and the economic stress that families are facing. Um, it's you know, really disappointing that that program has been cut. Um, uh, Healthy Futures, which is a early childhood uh, mental health consultation program is actually um, receiving some additional money. Uh, we're still trying to figure out what that's gonna look like, but I think um, the fact that the mayor is at least committing to providing more mental health supports for our littlest learners and our early childhood educators is a good thing. Um, and in terms of federal, federal relief for early childhood, the district received uh, $6 million. I, I don't know if you all watched the hearing today um, with Hansel, but she was talking uh, vaguely about what they're planning on doing with that money. Um, but we, we would like to see some of that money be used um, to provide emergency relief. So transitioning to our pre-K three through adult uh, uh, education budget, as you all know, the mayor um, was almost able to keep her promise of a 4% increase. Um, and so with the 3% increase that she's proposing, that is going to raise the per people amount from uh, $10,980 to $11,310. And CCFPI for a long time has been beating the drum about how district uh, policymakers have never adequately funded uh, the UPSFF. That is, they never funded it at the level recommended in the adequacy study. Um, when you adjust for inflation, the proposed UPSFF is still about $800. Um, below the recommended level. And um, that's where we were, that's where we are this current year. Um, so again, it's not really making any significant progress. Um, you know, even though it's not a cut, it's not making any progress. And uh, as I said, as you all said, there's gonna be a lot of increased costs that um, it's unclear to us how this UPSFF increase is actually going to help or hurt schools. Um, there is no increase uh, for the at-risk weight, and so I know that's something um, advocates have long been advocating for, again, um, to, to match what was put forth in the adequacy study. Um, even though the UPSFF base is increasing, therefore the at-risk supplement goes up a little bit. Um, by no means is it substantial enough to ensure that the students we know are going to need the most additional supports um, get them. And so I know today um, when I, I got the opportunity to testify um, before the council and a lot of people were asking the council to increase that weight, particularly um, given the climate we're in. Um, so in terms of digital technology and like whether or not the budget is making any progress on the digital divide, um, the mayor is proposing a six million increase um, for more IT devices and supports. Um, the, what are they called? The DC Digital Equity Coalition, I believe. Um, they got an email from Fairby saying that it's actually 6.9 million, so there might be a little bit more money there. But regardless, um, that amount of money is not going to be enough. Um, the Digital Equity Committee, they ran some numbers and they actually estimate that the district needs a total of $17 million um, to uh, accelerate the Empowered Learners Initiative. And this is specific to DCPS, um, just to put that out there. But um, in order for every student from kindergarten all the way through grade 12 to have a one-to-one -one ratio, that's how much money the district is actually going to need to invest. And so I think there are big questions there, right? Like um, how ambitious uh, or lack thereof the district is really being in terms of ensuring every student has a device. I think the other piece of this too um, is 
the internet connection, right? So it's one thing for students to get a laptop or a tablet, it's another for them to not have internet access. And so I think um, the coalition that I mentioned is going to be talking about that um, at a separate hearing to put pressure on the district to answer this question. I think, um, you know, the LEA should not necessarily be tasked with having to solve the digital divide because it is a problem beyond our schools. It, it, you know, you need the internet to apply for jobs. You need the internet to schedule health appointments. You need the internet. It's, it's not a nice to have anymore. It's a requirement. And so um, I would encourage you all as you all are like testifying or talking with council members like to, in, to, to really raise that message up that like in order for us to have equitable distance learning or learning from home, every student needs to have a device and they need to have internet access. Um, in terms of school-based mental health resources, so <laughs> the mayor in her presentation, I believe it was May 18th, um, talked about um, new uh, money in terms of uh, $1.5 million investment in federal dollars. What I've since learned is that while it is new money technically, um, it is supplanting local dollars um, for the school-based mental health program through DBH. And so essentially the program is taking a cut locally and then um, funding is being held flat overall, which means that more students will not be able to access that program. Uh, the original plan has been to expand the schools, um, excuse me, expand the program every year, um, I think on a like 60 schools per year basis. Um, and the indication that we've gotten from Dr. Bazaran is that they may still attempt to expand the program, right, um, without having the proper investments. And so we are deeply concerned about that because what that sounds like is either students in cohorts one and two are going to get less, right, um, which we know students in those schools are the highest needs students um, because that's how the program has been rolled out. We start with the students with the most significant needs and then you go down the line. Um, they also, uh, Dr. Bazran also seemed to uh, say that there might not be money for the DCPS and Aussie um, staff positions that are responsible for implementation of the school-based mental health program, which is a huge problem because how are you going to ensure that the program is running how it needs to run without those critical positions? Um, I think a larger issue too is that the behavioral health system is actually taking a pretty big cut um, in the mayor's budget. Um, and so um, even, you know, the fact that the school-based mental health program isn't necessarily getting any additional investments um, it's a bigger issue if the overall behavioral health care system collapses. So I think um, the hearing for the Committee on Health is next week. And so if you are planning on testifying, I'm happy to connect with folks to talk about that a little bit more and, and provide talking points because um, students' mental health is inextricably related to their academic success. And students are not going to be able to do what they need to do if they are constantly in fear, stressed out, and do not have the proper uh, social, emotional, and mental health resources they need. Um, and so um, I'm getting ready to wrap up um, and then I can answer some questions. But in terms of out of school time funding, um, out of school time funding uh, has been uh, held harmless essentially. Uh, there is a $666,000 reduction, but we've been told that that will mostly impact overhead costs. Um, but in terms of grant making dollars to providers, um, that money is held harmless. So um, I've been working with some OST advocates and they have all been talking about how they plan to, how they have transitioned, but also how they plan to continue to transition um, so we have some sort of hybrid model or even still mostly a uh, virtual model in the fall, summer and fall. Um, and then the last couple of things I'll highlight before taking questions is um, DCPS's Head Start funding. Um, I think, you know, we all are, are aware of that, that made the headlines a couple of weeks ago. Um, they're, lose, they're losing about 65% of their Head Start funding. 
Um, and when I did a quick analysis of um, the individual budgets and looking at um, early childhood positions specifically, um, on average, a school is losing about three early childhood um, staff. So that could be a teacher or an aide. I believe most of the positions are aides, but um, I looked at both educators and aides. And so the mayor, um, in her budget, she didn't put forth any additional money to address that loss. Um, so I think that is concerning. Um, and while we don't know what school is going to look like um, in the fall, I think it's still a problem that, you know, DCPS is losing that much uh, funding for its early childhood programs. Um, to end on a positive note, um, the summer youth program um, is being held intact. And I think that's something that for, you know, all of the youth who are you know, even though they'll be cooped up in the house, the fact that they'll still be able to engage in virtual um, work opportunities, I think is super important. Um, and uh, I think the mayor, you know, deserves credit for maintaining investments in that program because that is something that I think a lot of students were looking forward to. Um, and for them to be able to still connect with um, employers, but also with each other, I think um, will make a difference uh, this summer. And that's all I have on that. Uh, that's a lot. That's a, that's a, I know. <laughs> that's a, it's a lot. That's a perfect overview. I want to um, pause for a minute. I do see a couple questions in the chat, um, but I also want to recognize that um, Chairman Mendelson has joined us. Um, I know, I know we have some people who are on the phone and some people who are in front of their computers. Um, good evening. Um, good evening. Uh, it's good for me to listen. So keep going with where, where you're going to recognize. Okay, so I'm going to um, go to the chat then. I think um, Sean made it in first. Given the education budget cuts, are there ways we can ensure schools do not inappropriately use their special education and at-risk at funds to make up the difference? I would say that the, the problem of um, the supplementation of the at-risk dollars still exists. Um, the district has not yet solved that problem. Um, and I think um, that is very much, uh, how can I say this? DCPS continues to supplant the funds largely because of the overall inadequacy of the budget. And I think that um, this pandemic um, has created a, a, like an unprecedented situation um, where pre-existing problems, um, if not adequately addressed by policymakers, will be that much more worse. And so, I mean, I think uh, we really need to hear from the chancellor more about what their plans are, um, particularly for at-risk students and how they intend to leverage those dollars. Um, I haven't had a chance to look um, at individual school budgets that much, but what I can say is um, there's still a lot of inconsistency or like there's a lack of theory of change in how DCPS is particularly using its at-risk funds. And so I think that problem is still a problem. Um, and I think really it's it's unfortunate but it's not until like we're in the thick of it that i think we're going to actually be able to see um what dcps is doing because they change i mean year to year things change in in terms of like some years they allocate at-risk funds for this thing and then the next year they allocate it for something else and so that lack of consistency makes it very difficult for people like me whose job is it it is to analyze the budget to be able to like identify um, whether or not DCPS is actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. And then with special education funds, I mean, there are federal laws that govern that. And so um, I would, I am, I believe that DCPS, you know, is going to follow that, those rules for, for those funding. No. <laughs> I, I said nothing. I was on mute. Uh, I, the second question came in um, from Abe. Is the Empowered Learners Initiative funded through the UPSF or another way? I 
do not believe it's funded by the EPSFF. I know that there were private dollars that were also um, invested to support that program. But that's actually a great question. I don't, I don't recall how um, that initiative is actually funded. I don't know if the chairman actually can weigh in there. I don't know the program, so I don't, I can't speak to the, the funds. It's possible that uh, Lakeisha on my staff could look into it and come up and, and find the answer. Yeah, I don't think it's funded through the UPSFF, but I can't think of right now how it is funded, but I can find that out. Thank you. Uh, Laura noted that from the DCPS presentation, um, I'm going to add on reopening. Um, sorry, that moved. Um, implied that schools will be using their existing funds and staff to enforce new COVID-19 staffing during a phase two opening. Even a brief look at phase reopening proposals demonstrates that this is going to be a very expensive endeavor. Where will the money come from to ensure that our students and staff are safe if and when they start returning to classrooms before there is a COVID-19 vaccine? That's a great question and you know I think because of all of the uncertainty, like if I'm being honest and transparent with you, Laura, like I don't know, but what I do know is that the federal relief funds um, have a lot of flexibility and the district should be able to leverage those dollars to address some of these like outsized needs that didn't exist um, pre-COVID. So that is the hope and that is the intent of those federal dollars, but I think there's still a lot to be determined um, depending on, you know, how many students are actually going back into the classrooms versus those that aren't. So it's still a big TBD. Does the council have a say on how the money is used? So some of the federal money goes directly to the LEA um, and then some of the money goes to like Aussie. And so I think, you know, those decisions are made there. I don't believe the council can tell um, DCPS or Aussie necessarily how to spend um, its federal dollars. Can I just jump in as why I have this concern? Yeah. For the record, I guess. But like basically when it sounded like Claudia was saying, we're not getting more staffing for cleaning then it's like, how do we get DCPS to make the choices that will best benefit our schools, right? Like our LSATs are kind of out right now, like our budgets are our budgets. And so it's just really concerning to me because in the past when DCPS has received a pot of money, they don't spend it on our schools. They spend it on all sorts of little programs. So I'm worried they're gonna buy some distance learning program, which I'd be fine with if maybe, if we were gonna just do distance learning but then we have this whole presentation that's making it sound like I'm gonna to have to somehow in my classroom simultaneously run a classroom in place and be conducting distance learning with the other half of my kids who aren't in front of me while trying to maintain social distancing, while trying to stay safe, while supposedly having PPE, which I know, I mean, we don't even have soap in our bathrooms now. And they think that we're gonna have PPE then. Like, this is insane to me. Like I'm, I have been shaking like this whole time and then to make it sound like we're going to be doing that with the same number of staff we currently have. Like, I'm just, I am floored at how little regard we're giving to our schools right now and talking about opening in August. I'm floored and I'm, I'm disturbed, honestly. Like, it's, DCPS's presentation to me was shocking. Shocking. And they haven't talked to teachers and they made that perfectly clear and they pretty much made it sound like they're not going to either. I'm just... I don't, I don't know what's going on right now. It's very, very disturbing. And I feel like we're in the dark and we don't have any say on what's happening. Those are our children and we're trying to keep them safe. And I just don't, I'm not seeing it, I'm not seeing it. So I, I see why that couldn't fit in the chat. Um, <laughs> I, I get it and, and I hear you processing. Um, it, are there, is there any I guess feedback on where some funds might come from to help support schools, whether it's in DCPS's budget or outside. Like I know, Kubila, you you um, you and I thought this was helpful. Noted the what's happening with the overall budget with DBH um, and how that therefore 
impact schools, but are there other agency budgets we should be paying attention to, like maybe DOH or, um, or just like what, what resources are out there to help with this? I mean, it's DCFPI's position that the district is going to have to raise revenue to meet increased needs. Um, and, you know, so we have like ineffective tax breaks that, you know, the district could eliminate to capture some revenue and put it towards important, you know, needs like addressing increased sanitation, sanitization needs at schools. Um, and, and other outstanding needs. And so I don't think that the budget as it's proposed is a done deal. I think, um, again, I can connect with folks and share what we have in terms of like, how can we raise revenue? Um, I think what makes it all challenging is that it, there's just so much uncertainty. So um, I think Claudia said this, like what we think it's gonna cost us today might be very different tomorrow. And so it makes it very difficult to like, just say we need exactly this, am this amount of money to solve our problems. And so um, I, you know, I wish I had a, like a perfect answer, but I don't like these things literally um, are so unprecedented. What we do know um, at least is that um, there's revenue on the table that we can, we can capture and raise and we should be pushing for that. Marla asks, what specifically is DC Fiscal Policy Institute advocating that DC government do to support childcare during the next budget year? If there is limited childcare, how can the city go back to work? Yeah, so our primary position is focusing on um, increasing the childcare subsidies so that uh, childcare providers can actually cover the increased cost again of you know reducing class sizes and having to meet other safety standards. Um, prior to the pandemic, uh, we were asking the council for like a much more um, considerable increase. But recognizing the climate we're in, um, we know that like at a minimum, um, while the mayor did not you know uh, cut anything from the child care funding, uh, we need we still need a little bit more. So we're advocating that child care providers have access um, to higher reimbursement rates so that they can actually afford to keep their doors open um, and serve children, especially for those parents who like are not going to be able to work from home um, or who are seeking new job opportunities and need to get out there and get back to work to support their families. I see a question from Hannah, which actually might be better suited for Sujata. Um, if only 10 people will be allowed in a classroom during phase two, how will this affect early childhood classroom ratios of staff to students? Um, yeah, that's a great question, Hannah. We are thinking about um, how this looks different for early childhood classrooms, um, given that um, not only the staff ratios, but also the furniture and room size is sometimes different. And so we're looking at um, potentially smaller class sizes for the early childhood classrooms, kind of taking all of those things into account. Um, I don't think I can give you a final answer. It's still something that's uh, definitely under discussion and, and exploration. I see a question. Has DC reached out to private organizations and other partners to help with the needs of DCPS, such as hospitals and other organizations that supply soap, hand sanitizer, and masks? That I'm, I don't have an answer for. I'm not privy. Um, well, I'm not either, sorry. Yeah, I know that I will say that kind of as one thing we talked a lot about during reopening, the reopening committee um, was suggesting that there's some type of um, as much as possible a centralized procurement process um, to save the city on costs like that. Um, they haven't, there, there hasn't been a report out on what that could look like or what it would cost yet. Um, but my guess is that DCPS is having some conversations around coordinated procurement of those items at schools, or at least we hope they are. That is not a promise, though. Um, 
question from Marla. Instead of instead of that, can't they just continue the average monthly rate that they are currently provided? I'm assuming this is child care centers. That makes it stable, predictable funding that child care centers can rely on. Is it possible for Marla to come on and like explain that question a little bit more? Hi. Marla, help us help you. It's it's me. How are you doing, Camilla? Um, right now in this interim period, they have been giving child care centers a monthly rate. It's based on the average over the last 12 months. And they've maintained that through June 30th. And they've done that for the last three months. Why can't they just continue to offer that for the next six months at least? And it would be predictable funding that child care centers already know, have already adjusted to, as opposed to trying to figure out the new ratio with lower class size, more teachers needed, and all of that. You can really plan around that. Yeah, no, thanks for coming on it and clarifying. So, I mean, so one of the things that DCFPI is advocating for um, as a member of the Under 3 DC Coalition is that the districts um, provide emergency stabilization funding in the supplemental fiscal year 20 budget. So I talked about what we're asking for for the proposed fiscal year 21 budget, which wouldn't start until later this fall. Um, so those additional six months would need to be funded through the fiscal year 20 budget. And so we are asking um, the council to add uh, 10 million uh, so that providers can actually continue to have um, some sustainability um, while you know we figure out what our city is going to look like when it opens up. So that is something that we're definitely pushing for um, uh, because we know it's, it's an issue. It's a, it's a huge issue. Thank you. Okay, uh, quick housekeeping. I have two questions in the queue currently. Uh, it is 801. Um, I encourage people if they do have questions to throw them in the chat so we know um, kind of what's coming our way as we get closer to um, 8.15, which is normally when we wrap up. Um, I have from Rhonda, will New Heights be functional um, next year? And were there discussions to partner with the program for childcare services for city parents, non-students, question mark? Yeah, so I haven't gotten into the capital budget that much. Um, I mostly just focus on the operational budget. So can I follow up? Ebony with you and Ebony Rose and Cinda answer to that. Well, New Heights is the um, the teen parent program. Oh, okay. So it's not a child care center. Mm -mm. My bad. <laughs> um, that I still don't know the answer. So let me follow up. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least you know where to look. <laughs> uh, awesome. Okay. Uh, Sean, has Aussie considered how they will face bus transportation for SPED students. Bus rides already take more than an hour due to limited drivers. Yeah, that I also don't know the answer to. And I don't know if this was asked during the hearing today, um, Chairman Mendelson, um, if that came up, if Hansel uh, was able to speak to that. I'm afraid that I got distracted. Somebody was running a vacuum cleaner. What, what's the issue? Uh, so there's a question about how OSSI will consider um, bus transportation for SPED students. Yes, that came up today at the hearing and uh, there's not a clear answer, which is true for a whole lot of the reopening. Um, until the schools are fully reopened, they're not going to fully need their bus fleet. And uh, to what extent they need it is just not clear um, as we gradually move toward reopening. So it's like what you said earlier, to be determined. Okay. Uh, that is the last question I have in the chat. I will do a, a last call. Okay. Um, are there any, wait. Oh, thank you, Kabila. Uh, Kabila has shared her contact info in the chat um, for people who want to connect with her. Um, she is really good about answering questions and following up. She's also really helpful um, to people if they are trying to prepare testimony. So please take her up. 
um, on those offers she extended. Um, were there any questions for the chairman specifically since we have him here? Let me jump in if I can. Laura Fuchs asked a question a little while ago. Does the council have any say on how the federal money is used? Yeah. This is something we're trying to figure out. Uh, some of, there's a whole lot of money that um, Congress has adopted for relief and everybody's focused on the uh, 1.25 billion that each state is supposed to get because the district didn't get the full amount. Everybody's focusing on that and that money is largely unallocated. But then there are other pots of money uh, that come to the states. I can't remember the exact amount, but I think uh, ASI has access to something like $60 million. Uh, and I might be off by that number, but the point is that it's not insignificant, but it's for a relatively specific purpose. Um, so uh, they have some money that's available for childcare and uh, they have some money that correlates roughly with Title I but it has less restrictions than Title I. And uh, I, at this point, I don't know all the money that they have, and I've asked them to provide us with an itemization of all the money that they have. So that which has been basically directed by Congress, for instance, the Title I type money, it's not Title I, but like that, uh, there's not discretion over how it gets spent, not, not on the local level. I mean, there's some discretion within the LEAs, but there's not discretion like the council can come in and say, oh, we're gonna make this available for early childhood or for adult education. We don't have that discretion. There's unallocated money. Uh, the amount of unallocated money that we have is about $495 million. That's what we got as a territory, which every one of us resents. And it is my impression that that money has all been accounted for, given the different kinds of costs and relief that the district is already providing. For instance, setting up a hospital over at the convention center for six months, that costs a lot of money. And that's where some of that 495 million will go. If we get the additional 730 million, which is what we want and what we've been advocating for, that money is unallocated. It's my view that the council should be able to look at how that gets spent. So I would like the council to have a say on how the unallocated money is used. We are trying to identify what money right now is un un unallocated and we have an eye open for whether there'll be additional unallocated money and that we will have some say over. The money that has been directed, uh, I mentioned before the Title I type money, there is discretion within the executive, but I don't know to what extent the council would have discretion. And uh, so that came up today in that uh, there's money for childcare, I think it's like six million. Uh, is that gonna go as subsidies to help child childcare facilities or is it gonna be used to provide supplies and PPE to child care facilities. I think actually ASI is looking to use it for another purpose related to child care facilities. And I, it's not clear to me how the council can step in and actually make that decision. It's not clear to me. So that's a long answer. It's a lot of money. There are different uh, attributes to the different pots of money. And uh, it's not clear uh, what role we have. Thank you. I don't know if there were other questions. Uh, Sajasa actually has a comment. I'm going to read it and Sajasa, tell me if there's anything you want to add to this. Um, she wanted to answer a question that was asked earlier about budgets. Um, DCPS Central will supply schools what they need on top of what they already budgeted for in terms of PPE, sanitizer, and extra cleaning needs. We are not expecting schools to cover all the extra COVID needs for these supplies from their own budgets. Um, Sajata, is there anything you'd like to add to that or? I, I think that pretty much covers it. I mean, full disclosure, I don't work on budgets, um, but was able to just confer with a colleague quickly to get that answer. Let me add, I, I had a meeting this morning with the chancellor who said that uh, some of these additional costs would be covered by ASI. 
And we had a hearing this afternoon with ASI, in which ASI said, no, they're not providing this support, that it would be coming, for instance, the supplies would be coming from a centralized procurement system. Um, so I don't think it's really clear. I can tell you that uh, my position, and I think where the council will be, is that these additional costs have to be picked up by the government outside of DCPS. Thank you. That's that's as helpful as it right. It's really helpful and as helpful as it can be um, at this point. Uh, are there other questions? I don't want to. I don't want to skip anyone. If I have skipped anyone. Okay. Um, quick, uh, I, Chairman Mendelson. I don't know if you had any kind of final words or thoughts. Well, uh, I could toss out a couple of things. One is, uh, first of all, I appreciate you letting me crash your meeting. Uh, and if this was happening real instead of virtual, I would just show up, so I'd crash it anyway. The, um, there were, there's a, been a little bit of complaint about the public participation process at the council hearings, but there will be a hearing the committee as a whole has on the, I believe it's the 17th and 18th. I don't have those dates in front of me. I was told by my staff that the Sign up deadline is tomorrow at close of business. Uh, that sounds a little too early, uh, but uh, people can call the committee of the whole uh, and find out what the deadline is, uh, or people can just go to the committee of the whole. Um, I don't have that ad uh, email address. I think it's. Um, it's cow at dccouncil.us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, to sign up to testify. Um, and that will. I will take testimony regarding education as well as any other aspect of the uh, Local Budget Act, the Federal Budget Act, the BSA, and the supplemental for the current fiscal year. It's actually the official hearing that the council is having on the budget. Um, so there is that opportunity for additional participation. Uh, I am virtually certain that the council will not reduce the additional funding that the mayor put in for education. Um, and my guess is nobody else is thinking that, uh, nobody on this, at this meeting is thinking that we're gonna do that. Uh, we will look to see whether we can find additional dollars. That's gonna be difficult. Um, and uh, I'll see if we can meet some of these uh, additional needs that ha have been identified at today's hearing as well as in this call. Awesome, thank you. I mean, if we're gonna get Zoom bombed, we would prefer it be by the council chair instead of some of the other things that have happened to people lately. So thank you for joining us. Uh, sure. Kabila, did, I, I feel like um, I didn't ask you, did you have, it, have any kind of final words? Nope, again, just thank you everyone and I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, um, DCFPI and some other folks, we have ideas on how to raise revenue so we can pay for some of these really important needs. And so I'm happy to share those with folks. Awesome, so it is 8.12. Um, we will definitely adjourn by 8.15. I wanna thank everyone uh, for joining us this evening. Um, as I shared previously, um, so we are recording these virtual meetings um, and we've already posted the ones from April and May. So we'll post the one from June as well. Um, we will also share out um, both the information that uh, Claudia um, has asked us to about the survey so people can give their feedback um, and we'll continue to share out things around how people can um, interact with the budget um, since we know that this is a, um, you know, a lot's going on and this is a different time frame than usual and there are a lot of different ways um, that people can be a part of that process and we absolutely encourage people to be a part of that process. Um, this is our final meeting for the school year, um, whether in person or virtual, because it's June. Um, we do take a break for July and August. Uh, we, we likely will be um, kind of online though and continue to share things, especially because some schools still have graduation. Um, so we love to share good news about schools um, and then keeping an eye out for any information as um, things develop. So I just want to thank everyone um, for closing out what has been, um, you know, an unusual year 
I think when I think when I think back to the end of 2019, we thought 2020 was going to be so much better if you look at all the memes. So um, again, just thank you. And I think that's it for this evening. Um, please email our War Summit Ed account if there's anything else that's War Summit Ed at yahoo.com. Um, or you can get in contact with us on social media. Um, have a good night, everyone. We're one minute early. It's 814 and we are adjourned. Thank you. Good night. Good night.